Hello, everyone. I'm going to speak about fuzzing JavaScript engines for fun and profit. Uh, this talk is going to be about how me and my colleague try to fuzz the JavaScript engines in a different way. We tried a new approach, but it might not be perfect. And you might think that it's kind of abstract, but uh, yeah, please listen carefully. Yeah. Um, before I start my speech, I'm going, going to um, introduce myself and my colleague. Uh, my name is Arum Lee, and I'm a member of a hacking group in Korea named SSG. And I'm still an undergrad student in Sejong University. And I've worked as an intern at Fortinet headquarters in Sunnyvale last year. And I'm an alumnus of BOB, which is Korea's next generation security experts educational program. And currently, I'm working as a security consultant in a company which I prefer not to name at this moment. And this is my colleague. He is sitting down there <laughs> while I present here. And he is also a member of the same hacking group I belong to. And he is working as a researcher at a company named Theory. He was my mentor when I was part of the BOB program. And he uh, proudly says that he's a full-time daddy. So yeah. Um, we're going to present about what we did in this order. So we're going to give an overview about what we aimed to do and how we did it, and then give uh, specifics about our fuzzer, um, describe each uh, part in detail, and then give a conclusion, and then end the presentation. So to start, this is what we aimed to do. What we wanted to do was find vulnerabilities in browser JavaScript engines, such as V8, JavaScript Core, Chakra Core, SpiderMonkey. And for doing this, we wanted to utilize the fuzzer. So um, why fuzzer and why browser? Why JavaScript? So we prepared the answers for that. We decided to target browsers because Everyone uses browsers. So if a browser is vulnerable, a lot of people are prone to attacks. Users, like normal users, can be affected by malware or any kind of um, other things without their knowledge and give the attacker control over their machines, um, get ransomware, et cetera, et cetera. And web standards are continuously being updated, so new features are added continuously. So we thought if there are more changes to code, so aren't there going to be more chances of bugs? And that's why we thought that web browser security is a really important research area. And now, why JavaScript? Um, we selected JavaScript as our target because JavaScript is comparatively easier to exploit than DOM objects. So this is an example of a DOM bug. I can't see what is wrong here, personally. <laughs> and what you see here below is a screenshot from the comments made by various researchers. They were um, uh, debating about what the problem in this dome bug could be, but they couldn't find out. And if you see here, you can know that they just say, if you can't figure out the cause here, then let's just change the security D check to a check. They just closed this issue, and then that was it. So from this, you know that JavaScript is comparatively easier to exploit than DOM objects. And other reasons are the documentation of ECMAScript is really well maintained. Uh, ECMAScript is the standard for JavaScript. So if that is really well maintained, you can refer to it whenever you want. If you can't understand anything in the JavaScript code, it is really easy to refer to. And uh, moreover, if a zero day is found, it will work on similar JS engine versions, like if you find a bug in the WebKit, it'll work in Safari, it'll work in PlayStation. If it has the similar JS engine version, then it'll work. And then now, why fuzzing? Because it saves time. Uh, it creates many test cases in a short time. You can focus on other work, you can play, you can go party, you can do anything else while the computer runs the fuzzer. So if you can't find bugs, uh, and, and if you can't find bugs by source code auditing, you have somewhere else to turn to. Um, that was, uh, these were the reasons why we selected our target as JavaScript uh, web browsers and why we decided to use fuzzing. And this is how we did it. 
uh, we decided to create something called, which something we call a JavaScript fuzzing factory, which is basically a platform for the fuzzers. And the fuzzers will be managed, the nodes of the fuzzers will be managed by using Docker. And we will make our fuzzer create test cases based on existing one day cases. So there's an ice cream there. Um, I drew it just to explain this concept. You can think of that blue bowl, blue cup as our JavaScript fuzzing factory and the ice creams as our Docker nodes and the cherries on top as our fuzzers. So yeah. Um, so, and most importantly, what, uh, because we didn't have much knowledge about lexical analysis or compilers, uh, we decided that the test cases don't need to make sense, as in the code doesn't need to have any meaning to it, it just needs to create crashes. So that's why we targeted existing one-day cases. And here are the characteristics and environment of our uh, JavaScript fuzzing factory. Uh, we used in-memory fuzzing, and for management, as I said before, we used the Docker. And for creation of test cases, we used both mutation and generation. Mutation would be based on existing one days, and generation would be done by using dictionaries for JavaScript syntax. Uh, and for our environment, our fuzzing ser server used the Amazon EC2 service, 8 gigabytes of RAM, and 4 CPU core. Mm, and this is our overall structure. Like, as I explained before, I put it uh, into a diagram here. Uh, that's our JavaScript fuzzing factory. It'll be, it gets managed by a web, uh, web interface. Um, you can manage the dockers from that. And the dockers contain the nodes. Each node makes use of the fuzzer. And there you see weird names like Bella, Benjamin, but that's just the names we gave to the mutation-based uh, uh, generator. Uh, yeah, the mutation-based fuzzer and the Benjamin would be the generation-based fuzzer. So basically, uh, Bella generates test cases by analyzing existing one days, and Benjamin just generates new test cases. And they would both um, test out those test cases in the JS engine. It would be monitored, and if there's a crash, it'll be collected in our crash collector, which would be um, later analyzed or anything, just in case you could report and get some more cash. And uh, we'll go into details about all these parts right now. Uh, first, we'll explain, first I'll explain about the JavaScript fuzzing factory. Um, as I said, it has the management platform. It uses um, Node.js API to control the Docker, and the Dockers contain the nodes. Mm. The Docker contains the nodes which has the JS engines and the fuzzers running inside it. Mm. And our JavaScript fuzzing factory uses in-memory fuzzing. So we did this just to um, save this guy. Uh, we did this by making changes to the JavaScript engine code. Um, if you see this uh, code here, it is a screenshot from the actual JavaScript engine code from JavaScript core. There's a function named fetch script from local file system. And if you follow inside this function, there's another one which says fill buffer with contents of file. And within it, you see that it has fread through which it reads the JS files, JS scripts, which it uses. Like if we throw in our test cases, it would use this function to read our JS file and test it out in the engine. Um, so fread creates this guy. So to reduce this, we needed to make changes to code. And we wanted to do this just because uh, we wanted to reduce this I.O. It would save our disk, and it would also save time. So this is what we did. Um, the, screen, the code above is the original code, and the code below is the one we changed. Um, in the place where that fetch script from local file system function was, we deleted that function, like and then added more lines, um, which would uh, read the JS files as standard input. And then we compared the results. So um, the above picture is a screenshot from uh, the results of running the actual 
original JavaScript engine code, and the below one is the one which we edited. And if you see there, the three numbers at the right show the average disk IOs made within one minute, five minutes, and 15 minutes, respectively. And you can see that there is um, significantly less disk IO. And now, to explain our fuzzers, there's Bella and Benjamin, like I explained before. So Bella is the one which is mutation-based. Uh, we apply, it will apply mutations on existing one days by finding patterns from it. And this was done because there are too many test cases, oh, there are too many cases. Uh, there, it is really hard to find the patterns from existing one days, like all of them. You can't analyze all the files. So uh, we just selected some of them. And we did this by creating templates from some of the existing one days which we selected. We selected those one days based on uh, the number of um, vulnerabilities found recently. Uh, we found that um, from JIT optimization, there were some, uh, a lot of vulnerabilities recently, so we selected some of them. And we made minimal changes to them to create random JS files. And to do this, you can see there that there's something called Lego. It's just a naming thing we did. Uh, it is our approach to creating the new JS syntax. So uh, it was a name. Lego file, I mean, um, if we create a new JS syntax and make a new file so that it would uh, be a template for the new test cases, we would name that file as Lego file. And that, was, that would be the name given to the templates. Uh, so what we did is we parsed the one day POCs for making the Lego file. And from the Lego file, we would create new JS files. The Lego files will have parts where um, randomized parts would be inserted, and we excluded whatever was not important because we chose only one, uh, of only a few one-day files. And next is Benjamin, which is generation-based. Uh, we did this by making uh, use of input grammar. So this was done by creating input grammar by using library. We created libraries for separate aspects separate parts of the JS file. Um, but we faced a problem that uh, all the test cases we were generating had a fixed form. Uh, but what we wanted to do was randomization. So to solve this, we decided to make APIs. And this is just an example apart from the API. So what we did was um, for every part of the JS file, for example, in the JS code, you can find for loops, you can find uh, variable declarations, and whatever, whatever. You would just generate functions uh, for each of them and use it like an API. This is an example, and this is how you use it. If you see here, um, at the top, it says fuzz, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there's a function called tejawa, which is just used to call the API. And under that, you can see it being used in JS4, set variable, JS getter, or setter. All of these are declared in our API file, and you just call them to use it. So um, if you make one file in such a way, it would just randomize um, the new JS files in this form. So it would just uh, insert random things. It would have a fixed sequence, like it would have a for loop, it would set a variable and in turn, but all the little parts in it will be randomized. And lastly is our crash collector. It uses a regular expression to collect the crashes. So this is an example of what we used. Um, it checks if the register is null or not, and if it is, it just throws it away, says, uh, no, let's just not keep this. And if it is, it keeps it. And if there is no register, it would just classify it as unknown, 
and uh, keep it in our crash collector. So basically, there are three types of classifications. One, there's no register. Second, there is a register, but it has null value. Third, it has some kind of value in that register. So in this picture, you can see that there's a register, EAX, and there's nothing in it, so it's basically null, so it would be classified in that way. And so this is the overall structure, once again. Uh, if, you could, if you couldn't get it before when I explained it without explaining the little parts in it, uh, this is the JavaScript fuzzing factory making use of the web interface as management and uses our Docker to manage the nodes. Each node has our fuzzer and the JS engine in it. The uh, fuzzer contains Bella and Benjamin. Bella, contain, uh, Bella generates test cases based on mutation. Benjamin uh, creates test cases based on generation. Both are thrown into the JS engine. Um, they are monitored, and if there's a crash, it is collected in the crash collector based on our rejects pattern. So back to the point, it's like an ice cream sundae. JFS, inside it, the Docker nodes, and on it, the fuzzer and our JS engine. And to show the results, uh, this is one of the results we had. It was a crash produced by using Benjamin, which is the one which generates test cases based on generation. Uh, our target for this was Safari JavaScript core, and this one occurred uh, due to a heap overflow, heap buffer overflow in the web assembly while parsing the section headers. And now I'm going to show you, oh no, before that I'm going to show you this crash. Hmm. Okay. Not, uh, that was a test. I'm not sure if everyone can see it clearly. Huh. Yeah, so this terminal is already set to the directory in my desktop just for this conference. Uh, um, this is the latest version of Safari, and I'm just going to show you um, a demo of the crash we found, which I explained right now, which was found by uh, using the test cases generated by Benjamin. So, mm, yeah. <laughs> Just run the POC file, and you can see it occurring. Yes, that was the demo of the crash we found. And then we'll show you a demo of our fuzzer. Um, okay, I can't. Okay, so this is our um, web management platform for our JavaScript fuzzing factory. Hmm, yeah, once you log in, this is what you see. Never mind the UI, we're not really good designers. So you click Add Host, enter the host name. Mm, let's say it be demo. Host IP address was... Okay. And here you need to enter the root password because the Docker needs it to configure your containers. And please don't access it. <laughs> okay, it's taking time. Oh. 
Ha, did I do something wrong? <laughs> Or is it just slow? Okay, let's just do it again. Ah, there it is. Uh, you can see that the host has been added. And if you click on it, you can see um, it'll show your containers, your fuzzers, and the images. Uh, and now I'm going to add the fuzzer. Hopefully, I'm not making any typos. Uh, oh. Okay. Click on Add Fuzzer, and you can see that it's been added. Now, we will add our container. Hmm. We'll set our target to chakra core. Um, the fuzzer's been selected. If you, because we want our container to run right away, we're gonna say yes and click on add container. It takes a while. Hmm. Okay, you can see that it's been added and it's running. If you uh, click on stop, it'll stop running and you can resume it. Hmm, yeah, this is all. This is the demo of our father and back to, oh my gosh. Back to the presentation. Okay, we're, as you can see, we're still far from perfect. We're not um, perfect. We need good code co coverage. And because JFF is small in scale compared to the servers using be, uh, being used in other big companies, um, it has limitations. And there are limitations to creating different types of JS templates because, as mentioned before while explaining Benjamin, uh, it uses the sequence of the APIs specified by a user. So um, if one person codes for the, the templates for the API, then it can't be limited because not everyone has different types of imaginations or what kind of patterns they would like to use. Uh, in generating the JS syntax. So the sequence of the API usage may be limited, and we also have a few minor bugs, which we still need to fix. Um, and for our future plans, we um, think uh, we, we, will, we are going to keep track of the ECMAScript updates because as we said ECMAScript is the standard for JavaScript, so if there are changes to the ECMAScript code, there will be changes to the JS Engine 2. So um, we're going to keep track of them, and the ECMAScript updates will be applied to our uh, fuzzers so that it can be used. And we hope to enhance our JavaScript fuzzing factory to support other vectors other than JS engines such as um, graphics library or GPU. Yeah, um, that is the end of my presentation. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Yes. 
Uh, okay. <laughs> Very specific. Here, I'll make it easier for you. Ah, uh, yeah. Here. Oh, cheers. So on the slide 26, you mm -hmm. got a crash mm -hmm. from MSHTML yes. from DOM. Does yes. it mean that your father is also fuzzing JavaScript that contains DOM mutations? Oh, no, no, no. This, this picture was just used to explain the rejects which we use, the pattern which we use. All right, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Uh, did you base your uh, fuzzers on anything, or did you write them completely from scratch? Uh, can you can you say that again? Did you uh, base your fuzzers on any previous work, or did uh -huh. you completely write them from scratch yourself? Um, we tried to do it completely from scratch. Uh, mm. <laughs> Just because there wasn't anything else that did it, or was there another choice? Involved? Oh no, oh uh, no. Uh, uh, we did everything from scratch, but because um, we made use of libraries, those libraries could uh, refer to, to referred to other uh, code um, previously written by other developers. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, how many exploitable vulnerabilities uh, you have discovered by your father, uh, uh, such as in Checker Crow? Okay, uh, we don't have that many, but we have reported about 10, and I believe it was two, there were two Chakra Core cases, yeah. Uh, uh, in, <laughs> uh, in, like, uh, in Chrome? Yeah. Oh, okay. We eight. Oh, okay. Any other questions? Uh, did you get any CVs? 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 Number. CV number. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't get what you said. Can you repeat? Oh, oh okay. okay. Uh, so uh, uh, he asked that uh, uh, how many exploitable vulnerabilities oh, okay. have you found? Uh -huh. So uh, did you exploit them to uh, code execution, remote code execution, or some uh, some other ex ex effects? Could you explain the effects of your exploitable oh, vulnerabilities? Oh. Okay. For example, uh, remote code execution or something. Okay. Can I? Uh, <laughs> okay. Can. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Can I call up my colleague to help out? Ku, uh, 우리가 크래시가 나서 리포팅을 했잖아요. 근데 그거를 그거 그거에 파급력 효과 아, 효과가 뭐가 있는지 그 2016년도에 이 퍼저로 아 2017년도에 이 퍼저로 그 킨틴이랑 똑같이 크래시 똑같은 거 찾아가지고 나는 그못 나가 그, 그 사람들 나랑 똑같은 거 아니 그게 중요한 그게 중요한 게 아니라 그거의 파급력 아 파급력 IC 되는 거아 IC 되는 거두개 있다고 아, 알았어요 오케이 아 uh, you were asking about yeah. the impact of the bugs reported by us? Yeah, the impacts of your vulnerabilities, the, oh. the bugs you found. Okay, um, two, two of, of our reportings last year yeah. uh, were related to RCE, remote, remote, uh, remote, uh, remote control execution. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Fuzzer 
available for is the fast available for everybody to download or uh, uh, yeah yes your... yes we will we will make it uh, available for everyone but as i said we have a few minor bugs so when those are fixed then it will be released uh, on github i see thank yeah. you Are there any more questions? He's got one. <laughs> okay, then I'd like to ask for a big round of applause for uh, Ariam Lee. Thank you.